Hello and welcome to this month's episode of Unwound, a podcast which looks at the art of guitar making uh, through the eyes of uh, a different guest at Luthier uh, in each episode. And as ever, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, David from DK Classical Guitars, uh, who's going to help me uh, ask the right questions. But David, how, how are things? Yeah, very well, thanks. Good, Ian. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. No, pleasure. Uh, any any interesting stock at the moment? Um, yeah, well, just waiting today on uh, a new one coming in from a new author to me in Germany. A chap called, if I can get my tongue around his name, Henner Higgenlocher, <laughs> um, who was in uh, Granada for, I think, over 25 years and has recently, I think the last year, gone back to his uh, native southern Germany. Uh, so that's due in today. That'll be nice to see. Um, but I've also noticed that um, an awful lot more guitars coming to me in the last six months or a year from um, which were bought around about the 1980s, let's say, um, early 1990s. As as usual with most of my customers, uh, you know, most of them are middle aged men uh, who have come into a little bit of a uh, excess income in their later years. Um, so I guess, you know, they bought their guitars late 70s, 80s, and now they're either, um, you know, becoming firm, so arthritis, they can't play anymore, or they've died and their families uh, want to sell on. So there's quite a lot of that coming through. Um, a bit of a glut of Paul Fisher guitars just now, a lot of them coming through. Um, so yeah, that's a fairly constant stream of good quality guitars from that period, you know? Good, yeah. Yeah, really interesting. I will be interested to see some of those if we get the chance. Yeah, to pop them. yeah we've got a, I've got a David Rubio on the list just now, which is coming to me shortly. Again, that was uh, the early seventies. Um, yeah, there's some interesting ones like that. You know, so well, that's good. it's good to see them. Yeah, no, it's okay. Super, super. Well, um, this week's guest is uh, Luthier, uh, based in Scotland, um, and. He's going to bring a very interesting uh, and unique perspective uh, to his art because before becoming a luthier, uh, he was already a, a very uh, highly trained and accomplished uh, guitarist, uh, but not a classical guitarist. He uh, was, you know, various other styles. He's going to talk about talk a little bit about that himself, um, and uh, somehow I'm hoping he'll tell us a little bit about this as well, came into uh, guitar making, classical guitar making. So let's welcome him now. It's uh, Ryan Gibson. Hello. Hello. Hi, Ryan. Hi, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's really exciting to be on your podcast, Ian. I really enjoyed your first episode and uh, also the other episodes you've done speaking to players. I thought that was um, some really interesting perspectives from those guys as well. So uh, good to be here. No, well, no, thank you. It's it's uh, it, it, our, our pleasure. It really is. Good to see you again, Ryan. Yeah, hi, David. So, Ryan, just start by telling us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I mean, anything, anything you want, really. But I, I alluded to your your. Uh, well, I didn't quite know you call it a past life, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's all it's all it's all a continuous stream, isn't it? But but uh, it's it's really interesting, uh, and uh, it'd be good to hear about it from uh, your lips. Yeah, so basically, I think past life is probably quite a good way of putting it because it does it does feel quite distinct in my mind that there were these sort of two two parts to my life: the the musician, the player, and now the guitar maker. Um, and one sort of informs the other, but it's a very different pursuit at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said in your introduction, I was uh, trained at the London Guitar Institute. Um, or I did the performance course there um, and trained uh, as a contemporary musician. So we were doing rock, pop, jazz, everything uh, apart from classical, basically. So that was my kind of formal education, um, whereas I went from a very sort of amateur player to being in a very professional place. So it was um, very high level looking at all areas of guitar. Um, and classical guitar hadn't really been on my radar. I had a my parents aren't musical. There was was never any classical music of any sort in the house. There was a lot of 
Talking Heads and Queen and kind of, you know, rock stuff. No jazz. So um, all of that was kind of a self-discovery on my part. Um, so I started like a lot of kids when I was a teenager doing the Metallica and all the rock stuff, got into funk, which kind of led me into jazz. Um, and then I moved up to Scotland in 2005 um, and carried on with my jazz studies, studying under Kevin McKenzie, uh, who teaches at the Royal Conservatoire, which is a fantastic guitarist. Um, and then got myself into acoustic finger style, which was not not an area that I'd really studied much in the in the past at the Guitar Institute, um, and got really into kind of contemporary uh, acoustic finger style, the slappy tappy style as I call it, um, which is the Andy McKees of the world. You're playing across the top of the guitar <laughs> and slapping and percussive, and I, I I went fully on board. I went fully into that world. Um, which was good for a time and it got me into finger style, which I really enjoyed, um, which was kind of a, a progression into classical, which which actually came through guitar making, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, so it was at that kind of period of time in my playing, I was a little bit disillusioned. I'd been doing the performing and uh, teaching for a long time. Um, and I was kind of searching for a new area and I was searching for a new area in my playing actually um as opposed to any other kind of mm -hmm. creative pursuits um and then I really wanted to get my hands on a harp guitar now do you guys know what the harp guitar looks like yeah yeah sure uh so for anyone listening who's uh who's not they're basically it's, you take um they're from like the turn of the 20th century Gibson were making them and the Dyer harp guitar is the most kind of famous it was a dentist, I think, who made this crazy thing. And it's uh, just a standard guitar, essentially, with a massive arm that comes out. Um, and it's an extra sort of chamber to the guitar. And then you put strings across it, and they're, they're like harp strings, so they're drone strings. But you just tune them to a basic G major scale. They're normally five or, or six strings, big bass strings. And you just play them as a big droning root, and then you can just play the normal guitar on top. Um, so it was a very kind of niche instrument at the time uh, there were these big guitar orchestras you can see these old black and white photos of all these all these chaps mainly all these kind of weird and wonderful guitars playing in these orchestras um and it was the michael hedges i think in the 80s he kind of got his hands on one of these dire harp guitars and he was a big like he was like the sort of proper slappy tappy guy uh, inventor of that style i think um taking the Eddie Van Halen idea of tapping on the guitar, transferring that to acoustic. Um, and then he became a big icon for all the later guys like Andy McKee and Don Ross. Um, and he picked up a harp guitar. So then you've got Michael Hedges playing kind of contemporary stuff, tapping, harp guitar, harp harmonics, you know, the whole lot. Um, and so obviously to, to, to geeky guys like me, it's like, oh, that's so cool. I want, I want that, you know, let's do that. Um, and so then I started looking for a, a harp guitar and and you couldn't really get them. They, you know, they, they got a bit more popular. So the, the cheap secondhand ones have been snapped up and there was some luthiers making them. So that kind of got me onto the kind of looking at guitar makers and luthiers trying to find a harp guitar. But there were thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, and that just wasn't in my musician budget, of course. That's the the irony, isn't it, of this world? The musicians can't afford the instruments. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was looking at, um, different ways of doing it, funding, things like that. I wasn't getting anywhere. And then the classic, classic story of meeting a guy in a pub. Uh, so it was Portobello. There's a little, um, pub there that does a folk on a, on a Sunday, a little folk session. So me and friends would used to go down to that and, uh, enjoy watching all those guys play. And, um, a friend of mine was sat next to a guy. And uh, he had a guitar in his hands. It was a 12 string, steel string acoustic. And she's like, Ryan, you've got to speak to this guy. He's, he made a guitar. And I was like, distinctly remembering my head thinking, you can't, you can't make a guitar. Like, <laughs> you buy the guitars, they're in the shops. You don't make a guitar. That's, that's a ridiculous idea. I mean, who makes guitars? Um, I sat and had this really lovely chat with this guy. And he'd been down to the course in Totnes that is still going. Um, down in the south of England 
uh, where they do a really good, like quite intensive. I think it's only, well, David, you might know, is it eight or 12 week course or something? Yeah, I think it's about 12 weeks. Yeah, about three months, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think you make one guitar very quickly. Or, you know. Yeah. Which, which uh, to me now is even like astonishing. I don't know. I don't yeah. know how they do it, but I mean, to, to get people from, from nothing to a guitar yeah. is, uh, is quite remarkable in that, in that time. Um, so I was like, right, great. I'll go down. I'll have a little three months off and I'll uh, I'll make a harp guitar, of course. You know, that sounds easy. Um, but again, tried to get some funding, tried to get money together. Couldn't, couldn't really do it. Um, so it kind of got me on this little thinking pattern of, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I can do something here because I'd always been good with my hands. My dad's very practical. He's into... Like he's an electrician by trade, but, but always did stuff on the house, lots of DIY projects. So I'd always like grown up in an environment of fixing things and building things and making things, but nothing serious. Um, so it was in my head that I could probably do something with my hands. Um, and then just through internet searches, found the Annie's Land uh, course, um, which I think was mentioned previously on podcast, maybe. Um, but very good, um, very good course that goes on in the um, west end of Glasgow. It's now Glasgow Clyde College. Um, at the time, it was run by Bill Keldy and Paul Highland. Um, Bill was the main guitar guy. Michael Ritchie would come in and do some master classes and things. Um, and in classic kind of further education system, I phoned up for information and they couldn't give me any information. The website was very sparse. There wasn't much on it. So I didn't know what the hours were. I was working, you know, I was like, how's this going to work? And so I asked for information and they said, oh, you know, we, you just have to come in for an interview. I was like, well, I don't know if I want the course. Like, can you just, can I not speak to the course leader? You know, no, no, no. So anyway, so th I went for an interview for something that I didn't really know that I wanted to do. Uh, spoke to Paul, who's lovely, um, who didn't really interview me. He kind of, I interviewed myself. I kept telling him how interested I am in guitars. And he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, let's have a look around the workshop, blah, 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 blah. So I got some details. And uh, next thing I know, there's a letter in the post saying, I've, I've been enrolled on this course, you know, I've been accepted. And it wasn't even a thing. I wasn't, that wasn't the plan. So then I was like, okay, I'll uh, investigate this, see, and there was some funding available because it was an NC course. So it's trying to help people out, change careers and things. So I thought, well, Okay, we can we can go with this. And the the nice thing about teaching, as as Ian will know, is, is it can be very flexible. You can move your students around. You can let go of some students, take on some students if you need to. You know, it's a good it's a good work in that respect. So I managed to push people onto the weekends um, and teach um, and then do the course. Um, so that kind of got me started, and it was again not going to be a career change it was like a gap year when i was sort of 30 basically so i came to it quite late um and that was all that was in my mind i was just like oh i'm just gonna, I'm gonna well actually i thought i was gonna make a harp guitar but that got turned down straight away when we went for our little like free get to know you session with all the other students and Paul asked everybody what they want to make. And I'm like, oh, I want to make a harp guitar, please. And basically everybody laughed, including Paul, because he knew how hard it was. Uh, so that quickly got pushed to one side, like, uh, no, thank you. Um, and so, and I've still not made one, which, you know, I've got the wood for one or not, but I've not, not made one. Um, someday, yeah, it's again, it's another project that I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a lot of yeah. thinking about. Yeah, worth doing, because I mean, there, there are some, I think I saw one recently in, at the v &A Museum, and I think it was quite, an, uh, uh, I think from the early 19th century, okay. uh, I, th I think it was there, anyway, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's amazing the guitar traditions that kind of got, in a way, pushed out a little bit by the Spanish the dominance of the of the Spanish uh, tradition uh, that, that you know after after Torres got of course non classical guitars accepted here. I mean the tradition you know various traditions carried on, such as you know the Viennese tradition in some ways being developed by Martin and of course. Well, yes. yeah, but anyway, that's a that's another matter. But it's a it's a it's a, it's a great story yeah. uh, so yeah. far. So up to the, the, uh, the instrument <laughs> I love like because I learned a lot about 
uh, obviously the history of guitar through doing the course and things, I'm, I've got a very kind of geeky mindset. So I, I kind of want to know everything if I'm interested. So they have a really good library there at the college. So I was I was there bookworm, like at lunchtime researching, getting all the books out, which was fantastic. Um, and you start and you go to the museums. If ever I'm in a, a big city, I'll try and find the instrument museums. There's some like really good ones out there. And it's great because you can just see the, the chaos of Luthier's minds through the years because it's it's such a, a pursuit of like, well, what can we do here? Let's uh, <laughs> let's add this bit. Let's take this bit away. Let's combine these two instruments. Let's put keys on a cello. That will work. Um, and it's just everything. And, and what I like is all these these sort of modern makers. And I think some of them think maybe they've they've kind of uh, re like invented something. And then you'll go <laughs> to a museum and you'll see like sound ports in like really old early guitars or whatever it's like oh no no people have been drilling holes in things for ages yeah. <laughs> um, and uh the the story i just just to talk briefly about the harp guitar because it is interesting the um the story was it started off i think it was a, a mandolin or a mandocello or, or one of these kind of mandolin family and you can see pictures of like the evolution of the harp guitar because it wasn't that dire harp guitar with the big arm and the strings wasn't the concept it's basically try and, as all things pre-amplification, try and make things louder. Yeah. So yeah. they've got this, this mandolin or whatever it was, something similar. And you see it and it's got this little extra arm to it with like a little nubbin at the end, but it doesn't do anything. And it's just to enlarge the the sound box, basically, just to get a bit more of an air cavity into that, into that instrument. Um, and that's like the obvious place because the, the players here, they need to sit it on their lap maybe or hold it. So where's their space to kind of enlarge this box? So there's this like little arm. It's like a little baby's arm almost sticking out. It's quite funny. Um, and of course, luthiers, musicians, the same sort of breed, look at that and go, I could put a string across that. Yeah. I've got this arm. I could probably put a string on that and it would be all right. So you see them and they've got one string just yeah. across a little bass string there. Uh, and then, of course, they go, oh, if I make that a bit bigger, I can get two strings on that. Mm -hmm. And you can see where this is going. And it gets, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then people put, like, the um, the extra, like, harp strings, all the trebles down. So you get these 21-string harp guitars. Pat Matheny played one. Linda Manser, I think, made that beautiful thing. Um, so it's this evolution of, like, one idea spawns another idea. So anyway, that's the... A brief history of the harp guitar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's all these kind of weird and wacky instruments out there, and it's yeah. it. When you see what we have today, it almost seems a shame that we're quite like you say, Ian, like we have like the Spanish guitar, and that's that's it. You can't go any further than that. Yeah. Um, but there I is. I think that I think there is a there is a bit of a movement actually uh, towards variety now. I'm seeing more people, um, you know, pop up with guitars that have an extra couple of you know, strings on them, you know, or, or you know, drone string. In fact, I saw a picture of a quite a famous guitarist the other day who, who said, you know, picture he'd put up, a new toy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and it was a guitar with a couple of uh, drone strings mm -hmm. on them at the bass side, you know. So, um, yeah, I think I think there is a movement perhaps in the right right direction. Um, yeah, there's, um, the eight strings quite popular. I've got a couple of eight strings just now. Um, I have a clue what to do with them, but, <laughs> but they're quite popular, you know, uh, more and more people are playing, uh, I was going to say multi-string, they're all multi-string, but <laughs> extra strings over six, you know, um, yeah. yeah, I'm aware of more of it now, you know. Uh, and also, I mean, and Rob McKillop is, is, um, yeah. is at, at the moment promoting the uh, seven-string Russian guitar. I was going to say that, seven-string Russian has been on, well, traditional to Russia, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's it's tuned. It's open G tuning. Yeah, uh, mm. and has it has it has its own its own repertoire. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Uh, right. Yeah, and so. Yeah, I had a guitar many years ago from a Russian maker, um, which was actually a double top, believe it or not. <laughs> um, but he made uh, seven strings uh, regularly, you know, um, mm. on the Russian market. But it's never maybe taken off in the West uh, so much. So maybe now, as you say, um, more people looking for more variety. So, yeah, I think those things will 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 start to, to yeah. take off. But I th I think the, the the classical guitar. Sorry, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tangent. But the classical guitar was had had just a few figures who were quite overbearing. 
Joe mm. Segovia and you know John Williams and the, and 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 the like and you know, lots of, you know quite a few other other players and um, you know the guitar became associated so closely with these individuals, yes. but of course you know Segovia was playing a type of guitar that had only really been developed and perfected maybe a couple of decades before he was born. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Indeed. You know, it was a, that was a, the, the Torres yeah. guitar was still a fairly new thing when Segovia yeah. was born. Um, yes, you wonder what the early players of the Viennese guitars thought when the Torres guitar came along. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did they think, "Oh my God, this is awful"? <laughs> you, see, you see early photographs of some of the great guitarists from the first half of the nineteenth century. Uh, with their guitars, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and and also if you look at the music by uh, by Cost and by Mertz, uh, all of that music requires extra string. Well, a great de- not all of it, quite a lot of it requires extra strings on mm-hmm. the on on the bass side. So they were all playing, do you, as you say, Ryan. You know the kind of things that you would maybe see in instrument museums now, uh, things that were uh, not considered standard now. But at that time, well, there wasn't really a standard. It was, you know, there was much more room for variety. Anyway, that's that was a tangent, but but kind of related slightly to. Interesting. Um, no, it's, good. it's a good tangent. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny I mean, how the, the, this this um, traditional, as we call it, traditional Spanish model, is still really the prominent one, isn't it? Um, and I think Ryan, that's one you're more interested in uh, than the modern double tops and. Lattice, or, or or would you go there sometime? No, I I don't think so. And um, we're we're probably like I'll come on to sort of the the philosophy, I suppose, of of making. Um, but it was, I sort of as I was doing my basically when you start uh, the college course, you, you have the option of making a, a standard steel string guitar, sort of the Martin yeah. tradition, or you make a, a Spanish guitar, um, a, a Santos. Um, and they've just got their their two models basically, um, and obviously I was a steel string player. I'm not interested in classical. What's that about? Mm, that's rubbish. We do we do steel string, of course. So uh, that's what I made, and and I made my first guitar, and I spent a long time on it, very particular. But I think sometimes you discover things about yourself without realizing, and um, it turned out. I could make guitars nicely and and I produced this which is my still my kind of only real sort of proper steel string guitar and I had a very nice handmade it was a uh, from sort of the Loudon guys or the Avalon guys um in Ireland where they're sort of small factory guitars basically it's multiple hands making them and I thought it was and it's a lovely guitar it was a lovely guitar but I made my first guitar and it was better it sounded better it had more in it and I was like blimey I've never made a guitar before and I've made a guitar better than a very expensive guitar what's going on here and it wasn't because i was a particular expert straight away it was you know, i had good tutelage and things but it, it showed me that potential um so my next guitar was a baritone guitar again interested in that extended range still string 720 scale length which is a lovely guitar the bar again the baritone guitar is like the cello of guitar and it's been sort of forgotten about i'd love to make a baritone classical because that's that was the precursor before obviously steel strings were even about. But again, like you say, and it's like repertoire and fashions and things like that. But I'm, I'm always interested in the bass side of things. I'm definitely a bass guy. So I want to just get lower and lower and lower. You know, I, I just love that, that big range that you can get from a, a big bottom end on the, on the string family. Um, so I wouldn't make mandolins. So you, people can go elsewhere. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad we've got that, got that out. Well, that established. I'm not interested. I know a very good mandolin maker. So. I'm not, um, no, not waste any more of your time. <laughs> no, no, no. Just we're, we're ignore that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I made this baritone and then my third guitar. So I'd carried on studying. Um, I was like, well, I'll, I'll make a classical guitar because you've got to make a classical guitar. I'll see what it's all about. And it's a different making style, traditional, Solera, uh, soundboard made, neck glued on, slipper heel. Um, and the college was, was set up very traditionally, um, pretty much all hand tools, um, exclusively um, sort of Spanish techniques, string techniques, pretty much um, stringing, binding on animal glues, all that kind of stuff, which we can talk more about. Um, so I made this this 
uh, first Spanish guitar. And I don't know what it was. This is this is where you get into the kind of um, mystic part of, of guitar making or whatever, a bit like, you know, when you become a musician and you, you don't necessarily choose your path, it kind of chooses you, you know. And I made this uh, this classical guitar and something just clicked. And I distinctly remember in my brain just saying like, oh, this is this is how you make a guitar. Like, clearly, this is what a guitar, how you make a guitar. This Spanish guitar is, is it. Um, and I think looking back at it, it's the build process. It's it's um, much more uh, unified than a, a steel string, which today is made as a sort of factory process. So even soul luthiers typically will make the box of a guitar to so the body, back, sides, top, all done. And some guys will even finish it. So it'll all be lacquered up and everything. And then you get your neck and it's a dovetail or maybe it's a, a tenon, it's a bolt on neck sometimes. Um, and then you, you put the two together and, you know, guitar. Um, whereas the Spanish guitar, as you gentlemen know, it's built as one. So the top goes in, the neck goes in, the sides slip in, the back gets put on. So the whole thing comes together as one. And in my mind, I remember thinking, well, the, the slipper heel is, is like an internal piece of wood and then the neck. Whereas a steel string guitar, you're basically cutting that in half and then spending a long time putting it back together again, which to me is pointless. The reason for doing it is in factories. It makes total sense. You can make all your bodies on one side of the factory, all your necks on the other side of the factory, stick them together. They're easier to manage. You know, it makes sense. Now, people will argue with me about, you know, now you can have bolt on necks, you can adjust the action, uh, the set of the, the neck, the angle, everything, which again, makes, makes total sense. Um, but for me, this idea of one instrument being produced as one thing in one process one continuous process just made a lot of sense to me and i believe that's part of the essence of a classical guitar a traditional spanish guitar as well um so it was then that i made this classical guitar it wasn't very good um i think ian you've seen it years ago and uh actually i showed it to you david i came to see yeah. you as well yeah. And young, very, not even a luthier at that stage, saying, what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> well, it's a, I mean, it's a really good guitar for a first. Absolutely, yeah. It's a good start, right? <laughs> it was <laughs> yeah. a good start, yeah. yeah. I, could, I could make the thing. It's quite a pretty thing. It's it's well made. It's well constructed. Yeah. It didn't have the sound, which is obviously the the, the important thing at that, at that stage. Um so then I actually, this is where you come in, Ian, I, I sought you out as a, as a teacher um, because I had this contemporary guitar background. And mm -hmm. what, what was confusing to me at the time is, is I, when I made my steel string guitars as a steel string player, relatively accomplished, thank you, Ian, um, I knew exactly what a steel string should be. I knew what I wanted the sound to be. I wanted how it was going to play, you know, everything about it. So I, I knew what it should feel like as a, as a player. Um, and then as a classical, try to make classical guitars, no idea. Like got this weird flat fingerboard. It's really wide. The next day, you know, these silly strings that flop around the place. I don't know what this is, you know. So um, came to you, Ian, for some lessons over a course of, I don't know how long we saw each other, but I saw you every few months, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which was great, really informative. And um and then that kind of got me into the whole world of, of classical guitar and repertoire as well. And, mm -hmm. and starting to get into that world made me view the contemporary fingerstyle steel string world a little differently, compositionally, maybe not, not the same as, as the classical repertoire for me personally. Um, and so that was then bringing my playing into the, into the building of classicals and um, realizing through Ian's excellent instruction, thank you, Ian, uh, about how involved the player is in the sound of the guitar. So obviously we know that on a, on a steel string guitar, you've got 160 pounds of pressure maybe across the guitar. The strings are doing a lot. They're mm -hmm. there, they're really tight. You, you just graze the string and it will produce a sound. Obviously technique is everything of course, but in a steel string world, the guitar, if it's nicely built, does a lot. You can put a really lovely steel string guitar in the hands of an amateur average player maybe, and it sounds great you know yeah. it, it, the guitar's got an inherent quality about it that doesn't need all of the technique to get it out and 
what I found fascinating about the classical guitar is it's not true. You can uh, you can get the finest classical guitar in the world and, and give it to me, and it doesn't sound like the final, finest classical guitar in the world. Um, put it in the hands I'm of someone. Here. Like yeah, it's, 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 it sounds pretty good in, in your hands, to be honest. But yeah, but I've, I've got a long not, way to go. It's, it's fine. It's fine. You're, you're, you're point point taken though. Yeah. Um, and that it was that that really interested me because that's still how I see it today. That that what excites me as a maker. Is I'm I'm making half of a thing, and that that thing is someone's going to produce some lovely music on it, and the player has to bring the other half, and I, I really do see it as a kind of almost fifty fifty. A, a great player on a guitar that just doesn't have a voice is not going to give them anything. You're you're really limiting that player, mm -hmm. their range, their expression, dynamics, everything is completely limited on a on a mm -hmm. substandard instrument. It's it's just not there. You you know it's not going to work. And the same is true the other way around. So, um, you know, a fine guitar with a player that, that doesn't have the technique that's required is not going to deliver the best sound. It's just not. It's just not going to happen. There's no shortcuts. There's no plectrums. You can't. You can't get around. Yeah. Um, so I see it as a maker that I'm in a collaboration with the players. So it's it's fifty fifty. I'm I'm doing everything I can to get as much sound, tone, quality out of my instruments to make them as playable as possible, to get rid of any impedance for the player. I, you know, I'm trying to get rid of any obstacles for the player uh, to give them all of that room for expression and freedom to, to kind of discover these things on the instrument. But they've got to bring their best self as well in terms of their best playing. And also maybe the guitar inspires them and, and helps with their technique and vice versa. So I see it as a very collaborative approach um between yeah, very, very well put Ryan. that's excellent very well put uh yeah yeah no it's great it's uh it's something i th thought about a lot myself that um with a with a guitar well i mean there's a couple of ways you can come at this if you take an instrument like the piano there's so much mechanics between the performer and the sound produced that although different pianists do have the distinctive sound qualities uh, the, 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 the differences are quite subtle to the untrained ear and it's just because there is so much between them and the sound that's produced you know we get a little bit maybe closer to a guitar though in uh, a violin or a cello where the left hand is is now in, in contact with the thing that makes the sound um, but there is a bow as well but the bow is very much controlled by the by, by the hand in a very direct way. So there's 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 suddenly more obvious difference between each player. You give them the same violin, and they you can hear the difference in sound produced. But with a guitar, it's both hands on the strings, and that's why you know the same guitar sounds totally different in the hands of two players. It can be two equally good players, but they just have their own sound, their own way of uh, pushing the string. Um, their own obviously physical makeup it makes a huge difference whether the fingers are thin or whether they're thick and all this stuff makes a huge difference um, and but it also means as you say that uh, a good guitar in the hands of someone who's not a good player doesn't actually you know you're not going to get to hear that guitar really no 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 idea really what it yeah, sounds I think, like. um, Ian, what you what you teach a lot is how how much the left hand is produces the sound, it's not just the right hand. Mm -hmm. um, as Ryan says, if that that fingerboard has to be as easy as possible and nothing getting in the way of that. But um, I'm aware that your teaching Ian does uh, emphasise that quite a lot. How how much the left hand does pr produce the sound, you know? Yeah. Well, I think what's fascinating about what Ryan said there though is that even in the world of fingerstyle guitar there is quite a big difference between the steel string uh and the and the nylon uh partly because of the the high tension of the of the steel steel string uh, guitar uh, and i hadn't quite thought about that before uh you know just um you know it made me think that perhaps the reason that things like um 
the kind of fingerboard tapping and everything hasn't really taken off in classical guitar so much, partly because there is just so much goes into making the actual sound. You know, so much good. I mean, that's it's almost half the technique. I always think is is just learning to produce a good, strong singing sound. And of course, as soon as you start tapping with your left hand, you you're not doing anything close to what you need to do to make a good sound. So this, the difference in the sound that produces to what you what you're doing normally is going to be so great that mm -hmm. it doesn't quite fit. Anyway, that no. That's, that's, it's, a more, it's a more difficult line on the steel string guitar to shape the note with the left hand. Yeah, I think so. I mean, again, it's you're, you're sort of fighting. I think the the thing that um, well, there's a couple of points really. There's uh, firstly just expanding on kind of what what Ian was saying a little bit. Also, I think this this kind of good guitar, good player situation is is also about the player finding the right instrument for them of course and yeah. and i think that's that's even more important when it comes to the, the the classical guitar the traditional guitar um and what was interesting for me kind of early on when i started doing some of these guitar shows and you'd have a couple of your guitars on display and and typically there'd be sort of students there playing it and, and amateurs and professional players and so you get a real mix you know you get from from people sort of starting out and playing a couple of years to to the great pro players, um, and you get to hear the same guitar being played by all these different people, and they sit there for a little while, and if you're lucky, you'll be in a room where you can actually hear what's going on, and you can sort of see it happening in real time when when that player it's a very Harry Potter moment, you know, the one chooses the wizard kind of thing, um, and uh, you, you can really see how a player reacts to a guitar and, it, and every player is not going to react the same way and so my guitars aren't suitable for every player in the world i'm not going to produce the best guitar in the world because that doesn't exist it's mm. i can produce the best guitar for my my customers hopefully the people that like what i do um and so when you see it, it's such a lovely moment because this sound comes out of the guitar that, that other people haven't been getting out of the guitar and it's not because that player is necessarily better whatever yeah. that means yeah. but that it's just clicked. It's just clicked. The tension's just right. The feel of the right hand's just right. The fingerboard is nice for them, for their hands, for their technique, how hard they play, everything. And if it's right, then, ah, it's lovely. And you see it. And I think when it comes to the steel string world, you don't see that as much. It's, oh, interesting. You, you get like, obviously, there's a great degree of players from, from your, your sort of five chord strummers, very happy doing that. To your most advanced players and obviously the most advanced players make the guitar sound great mm -hmm. but i don't think that relationship is quite as obvious and and i think as a maker i like the challenge of the spanish guitar the spanish guitar gives me a lot of challenge because i've uh which takes me on to my sort of next point which is accepting uh that the traditional spanish guitar or any guitar to be honest is is a flawed instrument and mm -hmm. And I think it has a lot of a lot of flaws, but a lot of flaws that give a lot of character. Yeah. And this kind of relates back to what David asked at the beginning was uh, about double tops and lattice bracing and all this kind of stuff. Now I'm a traditional maker, so I don't do any of that. And part of the reason I don't do any of that is because I feel that it's trying to fix some of the problems of the guitar that I think to me personally in the way I like to make take away from the qualities of the guitar that I like. So I think as soon as you start trying to address these problems on a certain scale, you're moving away from a certain sound, a certain instrument. Um, so for example, let's, let's address the tuning issues of the guitar, forums and forums and forums about equal temperament tuning and like microtonal and frets that you can move and all this kind of stuff. Now, I'm not going down that route. And and you and I, and we've had a little chat about this, but um, I, a lot of this sort of chat that I'm giving now is, is kind of chat I give to my customers when they come in and, you know, they want the guitars to intonate perfectly. I'm like, well, buy a violin, you know, like <laughs> you want perfect intonation, do it yourself because it's yep. not going to happen. It's physically not going to happen on a guitar. As soon as you put frets on an instrument, you're taking away a tiny piece of string each time. It's about two cents. You know, I'm offered to make them a fretless guitar and say, well, it's yeah. the, intonation, the intonation's in your hands. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'll, just, I'll pull the frets out while they're watching. There you go. Yes, uh, I've said that. 
That's the one before. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's you know, as you set up a guitar and you can get it intonated as 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 best you can, but you're you're getting it. It's a compromise. You put frets on a guitar, equal temperament tuning. It plays okay in in all keys. That's that's what we're really talking about. So it's down to the player to then work on that and work around that and do things to make the guitar sound more in tune. And I think there's also uh, a certain acceptance to that part of the sound as well. You definitely want it to intonate as much as possible. Um, but you've kind of got to work around, uh, sorry, that's my boiler. If you can hear noise, that's my boiler going off. That's the one that's probably some home workshop is I share the workshop with my boiler. Um, and uh, you've got to like work work around these these problems. So another problem with the guitar is the volume. You know, it, it doesn't. The classical guitar is not a loud instrument. Again, it's not a violin. It's it's just not loud. Now, as makers, traditional makers, or all makers really, we're we're always looking to see how we can increase that and get the most out of the guitar. And obviously, the advent of double tops, lattice bracing, a lot of that's looking at this volume problem. Like, how can we make this box? A bit more shouty how can we get more volume out of it now the problem with that is i think for me you lose the nuances of of some of the things that you get from working with solid wood um and we all know as makers that the top is the most important part of the guitar that's basically giving you the tone of the guitar the air cavity is going to support the basses it's going to give you the low end it's supporting that but the actual tone of the instrument it, it's all in the top and I think the the thing I want to hear is I want to hear the wood. I want to let the wood do the talking. Um, and I kind of yeah. see my my role is kind of it sounds a bit weird, getting out of the way of the the wood. So I don't want to do things to a guitar to to manipulate the wood in a way where I'm frustrating the wood from doing what it wants to do. Now this is where we get into the mystical world of of woo, um, and I can't. I can't explain that. And to me, this is what gets me excited about guitar making, because as I said, I'm very geeky. I like science. I like my sort of quantum physics and learning about all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, and you, you, you tend to get sort of two types of makers almost. You'll get guys that are like very into the physics. They, they've got their, their um, equation sorted out. They, they measure everything. So they, they've got their braces and they, they're measuring the deflection of each brace with special calibrated things. And I'm not knocking these guys. It's just how they work, uh, mm -hmm. typically ex-engineers. Um, and you've, you've got to discover your way of, of making. And that's your way of making it. Again, it's not right. It's not wrong. It's just how you do it. And I'm not that even though I'm very kind of geeky and sciencey, as a maker, it's very much more my musician brain that I'm using. It's it's very much more like intuitive kind of practice. Um, so to me, it's that classic like conversation with the wood. So over years of making lots of guitars, you're getting into that conversation. So yeah, I flex my braces when I make up my brace stock, but I do it like this and I go, that one's quite bendy and oh, that one's a bit tight. I'm going to put that one in the middle. So it, it's very much a kind of instinctive process. And, and so this idea of keeping away from the, the wood, getting, not getting in the way of the wood is, is very much that conversation I'm having. And I feel as soon as I, if I was to make a, a lattice guitar or a, a double top guitar or something like that, I feel I'm, I've lost that conversation. I'm, I'm no longer like talking with that guitar. And especially if you look at like a lattice brace guitar, it's a, it's a uniform system where you're overlapping braces. Those little nuances, those differences within that particular soundboard are being controlled to me. This is how I think about it. It's, it's very much a kind of monotone type, like rigid structure. And you can make the top very light. You can make it very strong and get a lot more volume out of the guitar or more volume out of the guitar. However, to me personally, I've, I've then fallen out of that conversation and I, I'm, not, I'm not understanding what the wood wants to do because I've controlled it in a way where it's not happy. So for me, like a lot of traditional makers, five, seven fan struts, and I'm experimenting with like open harmonic bars and closing braces, one closing brace, not, you know, and I play with these things and different thicknesses. And um, so I think there's a lot of, 
exploring you can do within the traditional confines but i don't want to be trying to control the wood i don't want to sort of manipulate it in a way to where it doesn't want to be and i think the beauty of the the fan uh sort of classic torres structure is it allows a lot of space for the for the guitar to to kind of mm -hmm. have a conversation with itself to find where the notes want to be within that soundboard um i'm playing around a lot more at the minute uh with asymmetry not massively but generally my guitars at the minute there's then it's not quite symmetrical. The fans don't come out quite symmetrical and there's some asymmetry to the top. And I see that as allowing each note of the guitar to kind of find its spot. And I think if it's if it's too symmetrical, and I've heard some beautiful, like lovely symmetrical guitars, but again, it's it's just down to the maker and how they perceive it, I think. But to me, I'm allowing that space for the notes to find where they want to live in a weird way. And this is where I get strange because I start talking like a spiritualist. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, but that's, that's just sort of part of my making. It's the reason like, I really love using animal glues because of the way they work. It, it's just so much nicer than the modern glues, which I do use for certain parts of the guitar, but a lot of like anything to do with the soundboard, top joints, back joints, it's all animal glues, pretty much everything actually, apart from fingerboard. Um, my bridges are glued on animal glue. But like I've looked into the science of the animal glue. So again, the geeky side of thing, and I read a paper about the molecular bonding of animal glue and how it works. But again, it, it then goes into that kind of like little spiritual part of me because it's a cellular structure. So to me, it feels like I'm stitching the wood back to itself. Because mm -hmm. I've got I've got you know the soundboard here and I've got a brace here, and I'm putting something on it that's a natural cellular structure that works on a molecular level. It literally bonds on a molecular level. It's quite incredible. Um, and I'm sort of fusing that back as if I take it a piece of work, wood and carved until I saw the braces coming out. Now, we're not going to do that because who would do that? It's madness. Um, although Orville Gibson did that. If you've ever seen Orville Gibson's first guitars. Really? Like, really yeah. guitar maker. He took a solid piece of walnut and like dished it out like a, a bowl. <laughs> and it and produces an absolutely awful guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, never mind luckily he's just the face and uh, they started making some better guitars um so this idea of using animal glue it's not just it's practical to work with it's easy to clean up it, it's it's easy to fix and repair over time it, there's lots of like i could bang on about animal glue for ages but um part of it is is again trying to get out of the way of the wood i'm trying to put the wood back together in the way that it wants to be put back together so when I build, I don't build like a lot of stress into my guitars. I, I spend time making sure the ribs are nicely bent, that I'm not having to force or contort the ribs into the mold. There's lots of things you can do with making like, and it's, it's a bit like being a player. I think you've kind of got to just, and Ian, you'll know about this, like probably with students and teaching at the uh, various places is that you've got to find what works for that particular person. So Again, I can't say this is how you make a guitar. This it's just this is how I make a guitar. And you you see some other guys and they go, oh, I do it like this. And you go, Great, I'll I'll try that method. And it will either work and make total sense or it would be a mess. Um, so a, a friend of mine had a, a side bender, which is a, a contraption that they use kind of they use like big industrial ones in the factories. But essentially you can get a, a side of a guitar, the rib, and you put heat blankets and you wrap it up in foil and you heat it up to a particular temperature it goes into a, a form a mold and then it has like a big wheel when it presses the waist and then you've got these big straps that go down and it bends the bends the ribs to the shape of the guitar um so i've and it's it's a, a relatively quick method of, of bending the ribs so a friend of mine had that this is just an example and i i tried it and um it, i didn't have control and then the thing that came out wasn't quite perfect and, and it had a bit of sort of flex to it. So I ended up sort of doing it by hand to get it kind of fitting right. Um, but I felt that disconnection with the wood because I, I just bend over an iron. So it's just a, a hot piece of metal. And again, Torres had a, a, a an iron tube, basically, and he got coal from the fire. He stuck the coal from the fire in the tube, stuck it on his bench and bent his ribs around it. Now, 
I do exactly the same thing. It's just mine's aluminium with a heating element in it. And we've got electricity. Um, but essentially, it's the same thing. So, but to me, again, it's part of that conversation because when you're bending by hand, you've really got to like, you're in contact with the wood the whole time and you're listening to what it wants. And it will tell you when it, you know, when it's ready to bend, it will allow, it will relax and it'll be like, okay, you can bend me now. And then you, you can bend it. And so you're, you're fully in contact with that wood the whole time. And I think for me, that process is really important to, to always be kind of having that conversation with the wood, um, as opposed to mechanized approaches, which can be faster. And I'm not a very fast maker, but, you've got to find that balance. I use machines, I use routers for certain things. And those are things that I, I don't really need to be in contact with the guitar. So sure. for example, I, I route out the shape of my headstock and then I finish it by hand. Now I could do it by hand. I could use files and rasps and planes and da, 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 da. But the shape of the headstock is not a conversation I need to have with the guitar. Like the, the shape of the headstock is the headstock. So I can route it, it does a lovely job, finish it off by hand, job's done, great. But if it comes to joining tops and backs, then it's using a plane. It's I need that join to be good. That's the guitar, that's the voice of the guitar. So I I kind of choose which parts to, to mechanize and, and which parts to not. Um, so I think that's kind of really important to me as a maker. It, it's not all just about efficiencies, it's about maintaining a certain way of working to be to be happy really yeah, yeah. there's so much uh, yeah, that, that is, yeah i know so much it's, it's difficult to know what yeah. to put up on maybe um the stuff you said about animal glue is is uh, you know hugely interesting i don't know is, is it possible to, to send that paper as if you've got a link to yeah 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 i can find it yeah yeah, if, if if it's publicly available, we could maybe link it in the description. And yeah, yeah, I can. I'm sure I can root it out and uh, yeah. find it quite a few years ago, but I'm sure I can find yeah, it. That sounds incredible. Um, yeah, no, it, I mean, you you you're saying a lot of things that that that, that just you know chime with me. I have to say. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. What think are you about, saying about um, you know exhibitions when. Uh, you know, different players, you know, amateur players, students, professionals. You know, I find the exact same thing in my showroom. You know, I had two students last week from uh, the academy in Glasgow, um, and they tried many, many guitars, and a couple came out on top. And then yesterday I had two students about the same level from Edinburgh University, and two completely different guitars came out on top, you know. And it's just fascinating. You never really know which guitars are going to appeal to different players, you know? Um, and some you think, I wonder if that will ever move, <laughs> you know? But all of a sudden the player comes along and, wow, this is the one for me, you know? So, yeah, there's, it's, it's a mystery. <laughs> Each player, yeah. you know? I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced, however, that, um, that lattice guitars at, at, the, you know, at the back of the room are, in fact, well... I mean, they're, they're louder if you were to kind of, you know, take a decibel reading, you know, in 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 the room. But mm -hmm. but once you're sitting at the back of a hall, yeah. there's something about, um, especially a, in your know, traditional spruce guitar, that there's a certain focus to that sound which just kind of hits the back. Yes. Uh, you know, I think you get the quality the same at the back of the hall as you do at the front. It's the same yeah. kind of sound. I remember, remember, I remember years ago he he, he just stepping in, into the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and I wanted to see the instruments because, of course, they have Segovia's instruments. Um, but I, I went into the bit with the guitars, and there was this 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 guy playing some guitars, and it, I got talking to him, and he was going to be doing a concert, so he was he was rehearsing with them. Um, now all of the guitars he he was playing uh, were you know traditional. Spanish guitars, I mean, lattice guitars there, because they were old, you know, and, and one was a flater and some really nice uh, guitars. But it's a really dry room. And I remember standing at the back, the guitar that projected the best by far was the Lacotte. Interesting. Yeah. It, 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 the, the, the sound, each each note just hit, hit the back. Mm -hmm. And to him, where, from where he was sitting, that, that probably felt the smallest. 
-hmm. because he probably thought on on the flater that that was kind of making a lot of sound. Yes. But it, but but in terms of what sound actually reached the back, the Lacotte one. Uh, so it's just kind of kind of interesting. Yeah, interesting yes. what, 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 you said, what you said about trying to iron out the the, the imperfections of the guitar. I, I think there's a parallel. Uh, movement uh, which has happened in in playing and in interpretation that uh, there's this sense that you know Segovia used to he, he, he'd hit a note that just really sounded so juicy and so good that he'd hold it for a bit you know and and, and kind of milk it a little bit yeah. um, and of course there was a movement against that because there was this sense that you were imposing something on the music by 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 doing that but you know I, I think more and more that's just how the guitar works. Yeah. Do you know? And if you're playing music on the guitar, it's this. You're talking about a conversation with the wood. Well, it's a, it's a three-way conversation between the instrument, the player, and the piece of music. It's not. It's not. It's not. You know, we've got into this kind of mentality. You know, pianistic mentality of this very mechanical instrument. And and there, it's just a conversation really between the the composer and the interpreter, and that conversation has been projected out to the audience but with a guitar it's got this kind of it really feels like you've got this living breathing thing it sounds different every time you pick it up mm -hmm. you know, because of the atmosphere and the humidity mm -hmm. and all that of it, you know? it, it it's this you know what are you going to do are you going to you pick up the guitar you're in a really humid climate and the guitar's just a bit thuddy and dead are you going to are you going to take the slow movements as slow as you took them last week mm -hmm. when the guitar was singing out well, that would be silly. You wouldn't do that. If you, you wouldn't. That's not how you'd adjust to acoustics in a hall. Mm -hmm. You're playing a very reverberant hall. You take slightly slower tempos. You can't play the fast movements as you know as fast as you did last week in the dry place because you wouldn't hear the notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there is this um, kind of flexibility that needs to happen there between yeah. player, uh, instrument, and and, and piece. Uh, yeah, and and yeah. I. This attempt to get beyond that, they almost taking a pianistic mentality. Is, is, is it, you don't end up with an enhanced guitar. You end up with a, a kind of third-rate piano. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a living, it's a living thing, and you know, yeah. it's changing all the time, as you say. So um, but I think there's something the same in piano. I think I was reading, was it Andres Schiff, is he the Hungarian pianist? Yeah. He was talking about um, how uh, Beethoven, for example, wouldn't recognize modern pianos. You know, he wouldn't understand, <laughs> you know, because the way he wrote for pianos in his time was, you know, that's mm. all they had. So, um, you know, and he said he has to, when he plays, he has to interpret different ways because even though it's a, a more me mechanized instrument almost than the guitar, you know, they still have to do that, you know. Yeah, of course, he, yeah. He used to write a lot of dense chords in the left hand, quite low down. Right. Beethoven, and and you can see in the development of piano music that the chords, as the instrument developed, the chords started to be written in a much more, say, evenly spaced way. Right, interesting. On, yes. on, on the on the fingerboard, because in a modern on a modern sign way, uh, all this look it's, it's it's incredibly heavy and muddy. Yes. You know? Anyway, that's that's getting into another. But that, you know, no, but I think yeah. that that's a interesting point, though. Yeah. It, it ties into kind of other aspects and Ian, you'll see, like we talked a bit about my, um, you know, being a contemporary musician and, and getting into classical through the guitar making. But I mean, I, I struggle uh, at concerts that I go to, you know, classical guitar concerts, because I'm, I'm from a, a rock, a pop, a jazz background, you know. So I, I have to sort of sit on my hands uh, through these concerts because like, you know, if, if someone's, playing a particularly amazing like run through the guitar. I'm just like, I want to celebrate that. You know, I was like, woo, yeah, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and like, you know, uh, not thing. and then like between movements, like let's not acknowledge yeah. that anything yeah. good's happened. Yeah. And, and I, I, I understand it, but I, I don't really, I'm not really that, you know, I'm not from that background. So I, I find I've got a bit of that imposter syndrome going on because it feels to me like a bit strange. It's like a different world, you know. It's like I'm I'm used to again what you're talking about, Ian, in terms of interpreting what the instrument's doing or your playing is doing at a particular time. Segovia hearing that note, like 
I'm used to jazz. Like going to jazz concerts, you, you know, you don't you don't know what you're going to get, and the players yeah. don't know what you're going to get. And and just the the beautiful thing about jazz is is when you've got a great uh, band playing together, a lovely group playing together, just watching them feed off each other, watching them phrase off each other. I mean, I remember seeing. Uh, this is totally off topic, maybe. But Omar Hakim, who's this amazing drummer, um, played like big session drummer, but just incredible sort of versatile, do anything drummer, played for Sting and Madonna and all these guys. And he was playing at the jazz bar, tiny little trio. He was playing with Stevie Wonder's bass player. He's playing like an upright bass and Rachel Z on piano. And um, these guys were just the most musical people you've ever seen. And like Omar Hakim can, can phrase melodically on his drum kit i mean like rachel z would be playing this like amazing little phrase as she's soloing and he's like feels and his like little things that he's doing are just mirroring that completely i mean he's just he's so engaged he's listening to everything and i mean it's just incredible when you see this kind of reaction i mean that to me is what's what's exciting about music you know it's watching this kind of process happening between these players and you can see that in the classical world, but I, I think you're right, Ian. I think there's a certain mentality which has crept into to kind of all areas of classical, I think, in terms of opera, symphonies, classical guitar recitals. It's, it becomes a bit homogenous. It becomes a little bit too serious. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard the stories of operas opening up in Paris back in the day, and if they didn't like it, they'd chuck the chairs and there'd be a big riot and screams and shout you know the whole thing was like kicking off because that was like the cinema of the day kind of thing you know people people were having a great time and I, and I don't know if it's a sort of post-Victorian thing but everything's become very kind of guilty and, and there are yeah, yeah, kind of it's been a poor face to, I, oh, I, I think I think the I think the idea when I think it started when composers you know going back you know, say into the Middle Ages, you, we often don't know who wrote the music. You know, for example, you know that, that the composer was, that the, 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 you know, the, the music was was the thing, and they often actually didn't acknowledge who who wrote it. But as as and then music developed, and the composer became more important. But the music music tended still to be in some way functional. Um, you know, and and so the, you know the composer wasn't quite the kind of you know, big, you know, big deal uh, that uh, they later became. But once we get certainly into the Romantic era, it's that this the, the composer is suddenly this kind of great, great, great figure. And and at that time, that that's when concerts um, were kind of invented in a way. You know, people started putting on public concerts that you would go to just to listen to the music. Um, and so the you know the the, the composer becomes the 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 centerpiece, uh, but I think from that romantic era there was still a huge amount of variety in how people played and excitement and spontaneity. But I think what really killed that was the emphasis on uh, recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, and once uh, yeah. once editing happened, you, you know you had performers who were you know you know certainly dealing with 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 say a masterpiece, uh, and. The performer will interpret or spend will spend their whole life thinking about how this masterpiece ought to be played, and they'll come to very some very strong convictions about how it ought to be played. And suddenly, editing studio editing gives them the possibility of actually achieving that, that level of perfect. Now, once you go down that route, then how can you play it any other way? How how, how can you go into a hall? And say, well, I, I'm going to take it slower today because of the whole. You spent your whole life thinking about how the speed it ought to be played at. You know, mm -hmm. how, how can I stop on that particular note because it just kind of takes everybody's breath away on that one occasion when it didn't last night? Because I've thought about that for my whole life, and that note's not meant to be played like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, you see, kind of what I'm getting at. You know? So I think, I yeah. think that's, but I think in 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 musical styles which are. You know, by the nature, improvisational. It's different. Yeah. Different. Yeah. You know, do you not know, notice, Ryan, that uh, when you go to a classical guitar performance by a really good player, that it's really exciting when they they're playing on the edge of spontaneity and not improvisation. The notes are the same, but there's a kind of risk they're taking all the time, and you feel 
is this player going to fall over here <laughs> and collapse? Yeah. And just die, but they don't. <laughs> you know, I, 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 really, I, I, that was really exciting. But as you see, if, if you enter this recording thing where you play the same thing all the time, it does get very boring. You know? I think it needs to be recovered in classical music. What we're talking about, you know, uh, seriously yeah. needs to be uh, re recovered. Um, yeah. yeah, and if I can be. Um sort of <laughs> honest again I, I tend to be quite honest about things um i think for me what you see as well is is there's a certain age group that will attend uh a, a classical recital or classical guitar recital um and there's something going wrong there's a mismatch here because i mean it's the same as like a lot of jazz concerts that i've been to um where there was a lot of no offense, David, white haired people, and then me as a young 20 year old, um, and being the only kind of like relatively young person there. Um, and I think I see it in the classical world as well, where the audience is of a certain age group. But I, I obviously see a lot of young players. You know, I'm close to the conservatoire, I'm in Stirling in Scotland, the conservatoire, the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow. So I meet a lot of these young players, and, and they're hugely passionate about what they're doing and the world of classical guitar and repertoire and music in general and all the rest of it. So there's there are all these like really interested young players and then I don't really see them as much at, at various kind of concerts. Some, you know, the kind of bigger names maybe you, you'll see them. But there's definitely a, a mismatch and I think that's, you know, do they want to go to a church on a Saturday night in some little village? Probably not. So uh, there are young players that I'm talking to that are starting to try and change that a little bit. And and I think it's definitely a path where you can bring the kind of classical guitar, the repertoire um, into a kind of more sort of youthful, more modern context, but still keep the respect. And it's the, the respect that I really like in that world as well. Like as a contemporary player, I've played lots of places where they were watching sport on the TV behind me or something, mm -hmm. you know, like really like, and you're, you're sitting there and you're playing and you're going through the motions and your heart just sinks because nobody's listening to a note you're playing and you've worked your heart out to try and, you know, be the best player you can and all the rest of it. And nobody's listening. So that's destroying. So we don't want that, but we want something in between. So the nice thing obviously about a, a classical concert is, you know, people go and they listen, which is great. That's what you want. But I think there needs to be this exchange with the audience. And I think to me in a lot of, not not all, but in a lot, that that's sort of missing. And I think as a player, you're knowing and like, you know, that energy you get from an audience, you can you can feel it. And that changes your dynamic and how you play as well as the venue, but it's the people. And it doesn't really matter about the, this took me a long time to realize, but it doesn't matter about the mistakes because what people want is that experience. And if you, when I started playing solo concerts, I realized I had stage fright, which I'd never had with a band before, because I used to get on, on stage with a band, and then I was like, well, okay, we can make a mistake, and these guys are here, and they all sound great, that's fine. So the pressure was off. Um, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to play some solo stuff, I'm going to do my slappy tappy, and all the rest of it. <laughs> and started doing that, and just got complete stage fright. Couldn't play a note, couldn't even think of the first thing to play, couldn't, you know, just literally like a, a, a rabbit in the headlights, you know. And I had to go through a whole process to try and work out how to get through this stage fright and be able to perform in public again. Um, and part of that is learning to learning that the audience don't really care. And uh, if you make a mistake and you talk about it and you invite them in, they love it because that's what they're there for. That they're, they're, as an audience, they're there to experience something. And this thing's happening in front of them and you're talking to them about it. And it's great and it's not a problem and it puts you at ease and then off you go. And then when you do get it right, hey, everybody's like, you know, totally on board. So, and I think it's it's that relationship that would be nice to see in, in more classical concerts, to, to see a, an engagement with the audience. To And, and like you say, Ian, I think this, this kind of idea of kind of this perfection and it's really hard because the standard is so high. There's so many great players out there. So it's, I'd, it's not an easy thing to change. It's a culture. So, Ian, do you think the, the, the competition route has a lot to do with that? You know, yeah. It, it, you have to be such and such. Well, well I, think, I, think it, yeah, I, I think it has to uh, take some of the blame. But, uh, 
the, the problem is that the idea of perfection is slightly skewed because um, we tend to think that someone who, you know, plays, at least, I mean, this isn't saying classical terms where we're, we're, we're playing written out music. Um, it, so the idea of perfection is somebody that doesn't play any wrong notes. But if it's boring, well, I'd say that isn't perfect. Yeah, exactly. You know, the trouble is, the trouble is that in a competition jury, which uh, tend to work on a with a points system, it's very difficult to quantify the 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 qualities, uh, the you know qualities of perfection that are not wrong notes. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. You know, yeah. It's yeah. how how can you know if so some somebody doesn't play a wrong note and it is kind of generically musical their phrasing and and uh, they're kind of ticking all the boxes yeah. you know so if, say if it's out of 30 you're kind of thinking well I didn't I was kind of bored in that but just how, how many points can I shave off this person maybe I'll you know, shave off a couple of points because I was bored I can't really shave off more than that because they kind of ticked every box so they get 28 out of 30 then the interesting player comes on and it's you fully engaged. I think this is fantastic. Okay, first mistake. Okay, point. Point off. They're now down to 29. They're only one better than the guy that bored you. Okay, second mistake. But I really engage you, but second mistake. Okay, that's another point off. Now they're equal. Yeah. Right, third mistake. Okay, that's that. Do you see how it works? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So, uh, I think as well, um, you know, as you were saying, if, you've, if you have an audience who, who are not you know, in our case, classical guitar players. But if you have an audience who are not classical guitar players, then they won't notice mistakes. You know, my, my first teacher always said this: the, the, main, the main thing is to keep going. What, what they will notice is if you fall over, you know, in timing or or stop or get the timing wrong, and you know. But the odd note that's fluffed. If you're not a player, you would never notice. And I would never notice in a piano concert. If, Somebody made a mistake, you know, mm -hmm. or a violinist. You know, I just never notice it. No. It's not my instrument. Yeah. Guitar is a very exposed instrument. It has to be yeah. Said, it? So oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. The the guitar is almost impossible to play like whatever kind of properly we want to say, like any kind of perfection. Again, it goes back to that kind of flawed instrument. Yeah. It, it's it's a nightmare. Like when you start really getting into the guitar. It's you realize all of its kind of pitfalls and its difficulties, and but I think that all of that adds to the allure, the attraction of the guitar. Um, it, it's that unique kind of blend, like you were saying, Ian. You're, you're, you know, both hands are on the guitar, you're, you're hugging it, it's, it's very much kind of in your arms. Um, and so I think it's all of these things that, that add up to the, the reason that so many people love the sound of the, the classical guitar and its repertoire. It's it's that embracing of those imperfections talked about before that I think are, are so important, um, which is why, again, coming full circle, that's that's kind of why I don't think we should, as makers, be trying to completely obliterate any flaws of the guitar because, again, you should just make violins in in that case. Um, <laughs> uh, like uh, one one funny story, um, <laughs> which makes me look bad. Um, do you guys know Martin Taylor, the jazz guitarist? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So Martin Taylor, extraordinary jazz guitarist. I've seen him in concert a bunch of times. He lives close to me, but I didn't realize. Um, and yeah, I've seen him a bunch of times, different places. I love him. Great, great player. And so I'm at a little jazz night here in Sterling, little, you know, Thursday night jam night. And I just go and watch with a friend who plays. And um the organizers chatting to this guy at the bar, chatting away, blah, blah, blah. And then my friend gets introduced to him. This is Martin. All right, Martin, blah, blah, blah. And then my friend says, oh, Martin, this is Ryan, my friend. He's a guitar maker. So this guy comes and starts chatting to me about a classical that he's got that he needs setting up. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I can do it. Not, not before the new year. Contact me afterwards. You know, I'm busy, man. Um, and then we're chatting away, and he starts talking about being over in the States playing a Rubio in a studio I'm like, hmm, hang on something else something's going on here and he starts talking more about things and I'm, then i'm recognizing his voice a little bit more and i sort of stop him halfway through and go are you martin taylor <laughs> <laughs> yeah i am 
all right okay uh sorry i do know who you are uh nice to meet you um i feel kinder now um but then we get onto a conversation because he's like, oh, I'm interested about what you think about um, arch top guitars. Because I've made like one arch top as early on in my mm. making. So I, I kind of wanted to make everything and see what clicked because I'd, I'd already clicked with the classical. So I made an arch top, which took me ages. And it was a great thing to do, but it's not the instrument for me, which comes around to this flaws that I'll, I'll talk about. And uh, so I started saying my spiel to Martin Taylor and basically telling him, that his guitar, as in the whole world of archtop classical guitars, are basically rubbish guitars. They're completely flawed as an instrument. And halfway through, my brain is going, what are you doing? You're telling Martin, guitar Martin Taylor that his guitars are rubbish. Um, and uh, it's basically what I was... I think my friend said that he received it all very well when I explained. But it comes back to this point of the the cello guitar, as it sometimes gets called, the archtop guitar, as people know, it's it's a violin, essentially, or a cello, it's... it's plates that are carved out you know traditionally by hand um and strung up steel strings and it's rubbish as a as a guitar it's rubbish because it's not loud the top has to be really thick to because you've got this suspended floating bridge tailpiece a lot of tension acting on the top uh can be x braced or, or ladder braced um but you need to do a lot of structural stuff to stop the whole thing imploding basically um and the consequences are as a guitar for, for sort of certain styles of music, it's rubbish. It's not particularly loud. It doesn't have an amazing tone quality. It doesn't really do. You're better off with a more traditional steel string. Um, and people, will, let's hope we don't get comments, but people will probably respond badly to this. However, no, comment, comment, comment away. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> however, as we know, it makes a fantastic jazz instrument. Because mm -hmm. as soon as a pickup comes along, stick a pickup in that, stick it through a lovely tube album or whatever you've got, then all of those faults become things that they excel in with jazz. Because you don't want a big, loud, sustaining box. You want a nimble, quick, precise, dynamic instrument for your jazz. And that's exactly what those jazz guitars do. It doesn't have a sound post in it like a violin. You're not playing it with a bow. So you've basically said, here's a violin. It's amazing. You can't really make it any better. Let's take all the bits away that make it good and turn it into a guitar. It's like, well, this is this is a terrible thing. But it's then given a new lease of life as a jazz guitar, which is why you don't generally see people playing jazz guitars if they're not playing jazz, because they're, they're pretty terrible guitars. Um, but for jazz players, fantastic. And I mean, I love the sound of an archtop jazz guitar, so please do not write in. Um, however, <laughs> as a, and I'm explaining this all to Martin Taylor, and he's taking it very well. Um, as a maker, going back to the previous conversation we had, I, I'm not as interested in making arch tops because you can you can build an arch top guitar by hand and it's far better than a factory guitar. Mm. But is it enough difference because you're putting a pickup on it typically? Mm. You're amplifying it. So you're then putting all these things in a chain that are changing the sound of the guitar. Now, my jazz guitars are cheap guitars they're nice factory guitars that i've stuck nice pickups in run it through a lovely amp and i could go on stage and play the most sort of professional gigs in the world and nobody's going to think the sound is terrible like they sound great and you know my my ibanez jazz guitar thing i've got was maybe 330 quid it's great it's plywood it's great so as a maker i can make you a beautiful archtop guitar but going back to that challenge, it's it's a little bit lost for me. And some of the arch top makers might might not like me for saying that. But again, for them, making arch tops is is what they love doing, and yeah. go for it. Um, but for me, the thing that I love so much about the Spanish guitar is there's nowhere to hide. There's there's no extra things in the chain. It, again, it's what you're saying, Ian. You've got your, your your player's got their two hands on the guitar. You've got the strings. That's it. And all of that sound has got to come from that guitar and the way that I make it and the way that I, I treat the wood and voice it and, you know, everything. So to me, it's that challenge of making this thing that has to be light and responsive. And it's that classic thing of being right on the edge of breaking. And as makers, you're always pushing the guitar to see how far you can get before it implodes. And, and obviously that's where the best sound <coughs> is. You go too far and the guitar's ruined. 
you don't go far enough you've got a factory guitar mm -hmm. yeah. and and i think that's the difference with a solo luthier versus a small build factory guitar now i don't know how much time you want to talk but um <clears throat> just one last point maybe there's there's a really interesting thing that happens as soon as you to me personally as soon as you move away from one person making a guitar something's lost mm -hmm. and and they could all be very fine craftsmen they could all be very fine luthiers you can go to these lovely little boutique shops so there's maybe six or eight people making these guitars and got one guy voicing the top and another one doing this or that um but i've played these instruments and i don't get a sense of them i don't get a voice out of the guitar a sense of what that guitar is because as soon as you start making those processes across multiple people there's some sort of homogeny that that comes in and it goes back to that conversation with the wood and um very briefly there was the i'll talk more about it on a on another thing i'll probably be doing later in the year but um the leonardo research project that was that was done over in the netherlands was looking into sustainable woods basically uh, mm -hmm. which is another topic i'm interested in um and they set up um sort of advanced student makers to make um a steel string in <coughs> exotic wood and a steel string in in non-exotic native woods and the same with classical as well so so ended up with with an example of each a traditional indian rosewood ebony guitar uh spruce top whatever and uh, the other one would be a spruce top with oak or cherry and and just sort of more more native species now, aside from the sustainability and all that stuff, when they did the tests and they did tests uh, on different audiences live and online and all this kind of stuff where people just listened to it, what they did was they got a, a professional player to come in, play a piece and played it on all 16 guitars. So you had eight makers, two guitars each. And then over that three minutes, they spliced it all together. Um, so it was a continuous piece of music from the same player. And... There was no video at first and you just had to listen to it and then you had to write down where you thought the sound of the guitar changed so you've got 16 points basically and no one gets the 16 at all um but the most interesting thing about what we're talking about is when you look at their graphs of all their data it was all done very properly when you look at the the peaks where most people heard a change between guitars it wasn't between the tone woods it wasn't between the indian rosewood and the cherry back it was the makers. Yeah. So the biggest times people heard a change was when a different maker's guitar was being played. So even though they heard two different guitars from the same maker, they hear the maker. Now to that, that I was like, oh, this is, you know, confirmed everything I believe. This is great. Because yeah. it, it kind of, it's the first kind of proof that I know of, of saying the maker makes the difference. Yeah. And I've said this to other makers like Michael, for example, Michael Ritchie, you know, it's like I could make one of Michael Ritchie's guitars. You could give me a Michael Ritchie guitar and mm. I will make as close replica as possible, trying to match the woods and everything to what he's done. And I won't sound like a Michael Ritchie guitar. <laughs> I don't like <Gibson> guitar. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not Michael Ritchie, I'm going to sound like me. And and it's and you as a maker, you kind of experience that all the time. Now, I can't tell you what exactly my sound is and my guitars don't all sound the same i don't make the same guitar every time in terms of its sound they all have their own little individual kind of elements but the the job i see it as a luthier is is you're going for consistency of a type of sound which is your own mm -hmm. and again a bit mystic i, I don't really I kind of know what I like and I, I kind of make in a way that I like that feels right. And I think if you just kind of follow what feels right, you end up with something that works as a maker. And I think it's it's kind of as simple as that. Whereas if I start compromising, if I start using different glues, different methods, I feel like I'm going to lose that. And then I'm going to lose that that voice. And I think those little boutique things and then going up to like the factory guitars, that's kind of what you're getting. You're, you're not getting a cohesive thing. So obviously I would say this because I'm a luthier, but I, I don't want to get, you know, if, if something came along and, and, a, and a top player started playing one of my guitars all around the world and I was getting ridiculous amount of orders um, and I'd have to take on apprentices, which is very traditional. Personally, I don't want to do that because 
then you're sort of micromanaging and and the guitars aren't going to be mine anymore they're going to become something else mm -hmm. so you know guitar makers don't make a lot of money let's be honest when we're, we're, we're generally not rich guys as same as musicians there's all these parallels with musicians so you've always got to ask yourself what am i doing and why am i doing it so if i was going for the profit and i wanted to make as many guitars as possible then to me i would give up because i always talk about it as making fridges it's like i don't want to make fridges i don't want to like be in a factory i don't want to turn my workshop into a factory where i'm just like churning out the same thing because what am i doing i'll do something else you know so it's always that balance between enjoying your time as a maker and it's hard it's not easy every day is not fun but as a musician you're on that constant journey of, of challenge and improvement and investigate and exploring things about your playing and repertoire and all the rest of it it's the same as a maker every time you come into the workshop you're exploring you're making you're pushing things in different directions but it it's that constant evolving process um so i don't need to bring in other factors i don't need to try and get rid of all the flaws of the guitar I, i'm just working within those confines as a as a soul maker basically yeah it's very true ryan because if i'm carrying 15 20 different luthiers you can tell each one has a certain character and each guitar you get or if i have multiples from them then each guitar is different from each luthier but there is a certain characteristic to each luthier you know and every time a guitar comes it's a little bit different but you know it's you know it's their guitar you know mm -hmm. yeah definitely they get a voice i guess their own voice which i guess all the luthiers are kind of looking for in their early guitars you know and <clears throat> different experimentation you're seeing you know eventually get to the stage that like yeah this is the way i want to go and get a, hopefully a, a unique voice yeah. something yeah. people recognize yeah. that's great no really good really good that's been a great conversation yeah really good. Yeah, I think, yeah, we, we've gone, um, we've gone quite a bit over the over the hour, but I'm not quite sure how many because um, you, you said so many great things. I'll just have to leave it as a long episode. Yeah, I should have warned you. I can I can talk for hours about these yeah, things. Yeah, it's been been so interesting. I think it's worth just keeping in. Just before yeah. we we go off, tell us then uh, how. I mean, I'll link this stuff, but just give us a rundown of how we can find out more about. You and more about Gibson guitars, <laughs> the real Gibson guitars. The real Gibson. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a, a hindrance or a help. My name. <laughs> the real, the real handmade ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the, yeah. Um, so you'll find me on Instagram at Ryan Gibson Guitars um, and my website RyanGibsonGuitars.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook, but it's linked to my Instagram, so I don't really know. But um, yeah, those are the kind of two main places, the website. I've also got a YouTube channel, so you can just type in Ryan Gibson Guitars. There's not loads up there. Uh, I'd like to put up more stuff as I go. Um, I'm starting to make a, a sort of new student model, so hopefully there'll be some videos for, yeah. for a more kind of budget guitar that I'm sort of just going into um, so people can can check that out. There's nothing on the website at the minute because yeah. Luthiers are terrible at this stuff. You know, I don't have the time to, to do all these things, unfortunately. Right, right, right. But I will get some stuff up and there will be some information about student guitars. And you can see some of my guitars on David's website, of course, DK Guitars. Um, so, yeah. You can... Okay, good. Well, we'll get all of that added to the uh, description. That's great. That's well, um, that was a really good conversation. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ryan, for, for doing that. Yeah, really enjoyed it. For, um, for being here again. And thanks yeah. to everyone for uh, watching and listening. Uh, don't be afraid to leave uh, any comment uh, that you, you like. That Some of what's been said has been a little bit controversial. But that's good. Uh, it, it's all, it's all, all goes into the pool of, of ideas. And uh, we'd like to get your ideas as well. So do feel free to leave your comments. Uh, you can disagree as strongly as you like. Uh, obviously, keep things civil because <laughs> nobody nobody likes to be dealing with uh, angry uh, comments uh, typed uh, entirely in capital letters and that, <laughs> that, that kind of thing so uh, but, okay so until uh, next time uh, all the best yeah okay. thank you very much thanks, thanks. david
Thanks, Ian.